Matthew chapter 27. We're going to be looking at verses 45 through 56 this morning. Matthew 27. And if there's someone here that doesn't have a Bible and need one, just uh, slip your hand up and we'll get one to you. All right. Access. Have you ever thought of having access? I mean, we look at that in a lot of different ways. I mean, even when sometimes you get an app, you purchase an app on, on iTunes or whatever, and you know, you download it and you're looking at, you may brag about whole, all of this stuff you can have, and then you see that awful phrase there, in-app purchases meaning that they give you almost nothing. And then you get the app, and every time you say, oh, I'd like to see that, and you click on it, and it says, whatever price, $4.99 or whatever for that additional thing. Also, sometimes people pay extra. They go to a concert, and they get backstage access. So they can actually meet the performers. They can shake hands with them, get to know them sort of thing. Also, with access in mind, the questions always raised in the media, who has access to the president? Who has his ear? Who can go in there and actually talk to him and have influence? But as believers, those of us who have believers have something far greater than that. We've been given the access to the throne room of God itself. And as we study this passage, as we look at these few verses today, we're going to see exactly how and why that is. In verses 45 through 49, we see that the reason, first of all, is that Jesus was forsaken by the Father. In verse 45, it says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Jesus has now been on the cross. He um, was tried before Pilate at 6 o'clock in the morning, and he's been on the cross since 9 a.m., and he will be there until 3 p.m. It seems that during those first three hours of the crucifixion was that time where all these people came by and they were taunting, they were jeering, but something took place, something takes place at this time. There's this sudden awesome darkness that settles over the land from noon until three o'clock. And there seems to be, for the most part, silence. There's this heaviness. Now, some have tried to say this would be an eclipse, but it's physically impossible for that to have been an eclipse because the Passover happens during the full moon. It has to be a new moon for there to be an eclipse. So it wasn't that. There's no natural explanation whatsoever for it. But something spiritual is taking place here. In fact, we can prove, we can see historically that this was a fact because there was a Roman historian named Phlegon who described this and wrote about the exact hours that it took place. But what was taking place here, there was this heavenly transaction taking place as time and eternity intersected and the light of the world is extinguished on account of the sins of the world. Now, we can't come close to imagining exactly what happened, what, this, what the details of this transaction were, but the fact that Jesus, at this time, is taking on the sins of the world, receiving the divine judgment of God so that we don't have to. And at that point, God had to look away. 
The darkness is a sign of God's judgment. And at 3 p.m., it lifts upon the death of Christ because the judgment's past. The darkness that's upon our lives as well lifts when we have his payment for our sins applied to our lives. The heaviness departs. The freedom that we have in Christ, realizing that he died to free us from our sins. Now in verse 46 we read, And about the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus at three in the afternoon cries out, quoting Psalm 22, 1, as King David prophesies the suffering of the Messiah. The Lord cries out in anguish at this point, experiencing the, re the rejection do our sin. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin. He had no sin of his own. He made him to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. That's the transaction that took place right there on the cross at that time. Jesus takes on the full weight of every sin of mankind during that three-hour period. And as I said, we can't even fathom what that would look like, what that would be for him to bear the weight of all sin. But not only that, not only did I, we take, he take our sin, but he also gave to us his righteousness so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so that when we come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his righteousness is applied to our lives so now I can stand before God without fear. You see, because God is perfectly holy and can't tolerate sin. And Jesus experienced this rejection of God so that we don't have to. Imagine Jesus who had always known the presence and the fellowship of God throughout eternity now experiencing separation from that presence for the first time. That's when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced the separation due our sin so that we don't have to. In Christ, we now have the privilege of knowing fellowship and intimacy with God himself. That opportunity, that before it was never afforded to anyone. It was always through ritual, through religion, through the sacrifices in the Old Testament. They get there, but, they, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And after offering a bunch of sacrifices, and he could only go in there, do the ritual, put the blood on the, on the mercy seat, and then he had to leave. But now, because of the sacrifice of Christ, we can experience intimacy with God, and we'll see that further as we continue. In verses 47 through 49, we read, Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, The man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see, let us see if Elijah will come save him. 
This is amazing to me. You have these guys, these bystanders, and of course, what do bystanders do? They just kind of stand around seeing what's going on, not really being involved, not really understanding, not being involved in the midst of the situation. They miss the whole point. They misunderstand what Jesus is saying, thinking that he was crying out for the prophet Elijah to save him. Now, there was this tradition from Malachi 4 or 5 that Elijah would show up to save the righteous. And in, in a sense that he would come down on his fiery chariot as he went up in 2 Kings 2, 1 through 12, as he was taken up into heaven, that he would come down on his fiery chariot and deliver the righteous. So these folks were saying, oh, when he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, they misunderstand and to say that he was calling for Elijah. So I said, where's the chariot? So they started looking around for these sorts of things. They were looking for signs rather than for the Savior. They didn't understand what their real situations were. And, you know, there's people like that today. They're looking at the times, trying to figure out exactly what's going on, looking for the signs of the times. And, and it's important to be aware of what's going on, obviously. But the first point, the priority isn't knowing the signs of the times, but knowing the Savior knowing the one who has control over the signs of the times. That's the critical point. They had no view of what the scriptures said about the matter taking place here and what God was accomplishing through Christ, that he was taking the wrath of God upon him, that he was being our substitute, that he was actually taking the sin that was due them, that's due you and I. And many people are unaware of what God is doing in the world today because they approach, they seek to approach God, they seek to approach church or religion with a self-serving attitude, what's in it for me? God, what can you do for me? It's kind of like have the attitude of Jacob when he was in Bethel after he had fled from his brother and he was sleeping with his head on a rock at night and he has a dream of, of angels and ascending and descending upon a ladder and, and he said, oh, this must be none other, other I'll get it out, none other than the house of God. So he called the, the place Bethel, which means just that. But then he said, Lord, if you go with me into the land with my uncle Laban, and you bring me back, then you can be my God. And I'm sure God said, boy, am I lucky. But how often isn't that what we do? We go, we approach God with certain conditions, saying, Lord, if you do this for me, if you'll get me a husband or wife, if you get me the job I want, if you get me this or that, that car, this house. If you do that for me, then you can be my God. Missing the full point. Because ultimately, none of those things are going to matter when it comes down to the end. The only thing that you can take into eternity with you is your relationship with God and also other people. But for some people, if the, they don't see how something benefits them materially, they can't receive it. They see the work as 
the work of Christ as a means of material gain. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 8, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which accords to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdrawal yourselves. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Simple statement there. As Billy Graham used to say, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Doesn't work. You can't take it with you. And then we see here that these guys thinking, you know, Elijah's going to come. Let's give him some sour wine so he'll hold on longer. Now, this is different than the wine we saw before because the wine that before that Jesus refused was mixed with gall. And this wine wasn't. It's, gall isn't mentioned here or in the parallel passage in John 19, verses 28 and 29. So this was just simply that wine, the sour wine that generally the soldiers drank. But Jesus here, in doing this, declaring his thirst, as he did, is focused on the fulfillment of scripture. That particular scripture is Psalm twenty-two, fifteen, And speaking of his thirst on the cross, fulfilling the plan of God for his life. But we see something else awesome here as we look in Verses 50 to 53. His being forsaken, bearing our sins on the cross, his being forsaken gives us access to the Father. In verse 50 it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He cries out with this loud voice. We're given the words in John 19 verse 30 that he said he declared it is finished the work of salvation is now complete and there's nothing left to be done it's meaningful that the word here uses in greek a perfect tense because it means that not only was it finished then but it's finished, but it has a continuing impact throughout, really throughout eternity. It's an accomplished fact with eternal results. The fact that Jesus died for the sins of mankind means that any person throughout history can receive eternal life by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he meant. By it is finished. The Lord at this point yields up his spirit. Jesus had sovereign control, authority over life. In John chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 we read, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or did not overcome it. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18 reads, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Father. 
Jesus said no one took his life. He didn't die on the cross. You know, people, you know, as we mentioned, that one doctor who described the, um, the crucifixion and the details of the crucifixion, and the question is, well, what exactly did Jesus die of? Well, he wouldn't have died at all if he didn't yield up his spirit. He was in total control. As he said, no one takes my life, and no one did. He gave it up. But Jesus, we need to recognize, has sovereign control over our lives as well. In fact, all the details of our lives are in his hands. In Psalm 31, 15, it records, my times are in your hand. Recognize this and be open to God's working in and through your life. He's in control. He's got a purpose. He has a plan for your life. If you have come into a relationship with him, as James says in chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Whatever you're going through, whatever difficulties, God has a purpose. God has a plan. Jesus is in control. So when we face difficulties, we can look at it, and I know I quote George Mueller a lot, but he's the one who says things like that are food for faith. It's in the midst of those circumstances we can look at it and say, God, what are you doing here? What's your purpose? What's your plan? What are you about, Lord? What are you going to do? Let me be a part of it. Let's go for it. And then we read in verse 51, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now, this veil was basically a large curtain. It separated the holy place where in the temple, as you go in either the temple or the tabernacle, but at this time it was the temple, you'd go in and there'd be the holy place. The first place you would go, the priest would go in. There'd be the table of showbread. There'd be the menorah. There would be the, the altar of incense before this veil. On the inside of the veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top of it, with the two cherubim, standing over it with their wings on there touching. And it was there that the high priest would sprinkle the blood once a year on the Day of Atonement. That's where they experienced the presence of God. That's where when Moses was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, he experienced the presence of God. He spoke with God there. And as it says back then, that God spoke to Moses as one speaks to a man. But here, in the temple, there's this basically a large curtain, 60 feet by 30 feet. Early Jewish tradition tells us that it was at least four inches thick, which would be about that thick. I've heard at different times as much as of a foot. And this thing was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew, I think, stresses that because he stresses the impossibility of it happening by any natural means. It wasn't the earthquake. The veil was torn before the earthquake took place. It was torn from top to bottom. This had to be an act of God because it couldn't be attributed to natural circumstances. And what's interesting about this is that all these occurrences that we're reading about saying this happened and this happened and this happened, in the language it uses what's referred to as the divine passive, which means that it says the veil was rent. It doesn't say somebody tore the veil. It says the veil was rent. The earthquake 
there was an earthquake. All of these things passive, referring to the fact that God did each one of these things as a sign, as an indication that it was him doing it. The Jewish Roman historian Josephus records this event in his book, um, Wars of the Jews, the tearing of the veil, historically. You know, but the greatest tragedy to me is after all of this, there, there were these Jewish leaders whose hearts must have been so hard that the veil was torn open, giving access for the first time to everyone into the presence of God. And what did they do after that? They sewed it back up. But as well, it's interesting to me, in Acts 6-7 tells us that many priests became obedient to the faith. And I think this must have been the reason. that They, came believe, they became believers because they saw, oh, we crucified Christ. He died on the cross. And when he did, when he cried, it is finished, they were there in the temple possibly, and they heard... <sighs> That, that, temp, that veil was just torn totally. And there, suddenly before them, is the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, that for the most part, none of them were even allowed to go to. We're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, that the veil represents Christ's body. His body being broken on our behalf gives us access into the very throne room of God. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what we have in Christ through his finished work, through his completed work. Jesus experienced separation from God so that you might have access to the very throne room of God and experience his presence in your life. Remember that the price, the price that Jesus paid for you to have access to God. Never take this privilege for granted. But make the most of every opportunity to have fellowship with the Lord. I mean, sometimes we can get a ho-hum attitude about either you know, reading the Bible or spending time in prayer. And to be honest, that's tragic. Because you, we, when we look at the extent to which Jesus went to give us that access, that we might come boldly before the throne of grace, that we might experience fellowship with God. The earth quaked and the rocks split in two. It's interesting, the same word that's used for the veil is used of the rocks, that they were just torn in two. This is in a sense, as Romans 8, verses 18 and through 22 tells us, that all creation was groaning. Creation continues to groan until the plan of salvation is complete. Jesus said that said when he entered Jerusalem in Luke 19:40 that if the people didn't cry out in praise and declare his glory that the very rocks would cry out. And here we have the rocks crying out. But we shouldn't wait So long that God would use rocks 
we should be praising him in the glory of his greatness now. Praising him for the work he does in our lives. Praising him for his holiness, his glory. That's the purpose of worship. Let's not have stony hearts when it comes to worship. As we come in here corporately, as we worship, and we should worship ourselves at home. Just praising the Lord for whom he is, who he is, and what he's accomplished for us. Now in verses 52 through 53, We read, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. The earthquake that takes place seems to open many of the graves in the area. And the bodies of believers who had fallen asleep or died were raised after Jesus was raised. They went into Jerusalem and were seen by a lot of people. We're not given really any additional details to that, but it's likely that they either died again or that they were taken into the presence of the Lord. Since we as believers have been crucified with Christ and are risen with him, the scripture tells us in in. Uh, Colossians 3 1 that we should seek those things that are above rather than being preoccupied with everything taking place here in this world we should be preoccupied with spiritual realities that is our relationship with the Lord and what he's doing here and now and what he wants to accomplish through our lives I know I have this tendency I can be a news junkie you know, you get a, I open up my iPad in the morning and, you know, I hit on the news and it's like, oh, what's going on in the world? And they, sometimes the Lord impresses upon me. It's just, hey, wait a minute. What's really important here? You know, all this stuff is going to happen. God's in control of it. The best thing to do is get your heart and your mind right settled before him at the beginning of the day so you can go out into this world walking with him, walking by his spirit and being used for his glory. And that's how we have peace in our lives. You know, if we read all this craziness going on in the world, I mean, we we'll just freak out all the time. Because we, if we just dwell on those things, we think, what can I do? How can I control it? And the truth is, you can't. But if we're there fellowshipping with the one who does have control, we can have peace. We can rest. We can even have joy in the midst of our circumstances. This means that our primary concern should be the glory of God and the souls of men. If we'll do this, we'll find that God will take care of all these other things. As it says in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 31, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things... The Gentiles seek, meaning all the people that don't know the Lord. This is what they worry about constantly. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, as I said, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So what took place here? We see the veil torn open. We see the earthquake. Other accounts give us the sound of lightning, thunder, the darkness. An incredible scene there. How did the people respond? 
and how they respond reveals their hearts. In verse 54, we read that, so when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Remember that the centurion is a commander over about 100 men, over 100 soldiers. This centurion was likely part of the praetorian guard, those who guarded the governor there at his palace. And he was sent with a small detachment to oversee the crucifixion. He'd probably overseen scores of crucifixions. A crucifixion itself would, be not, would not be anything new to him. But there was something different about this one that shook him in his sandals. As a centurion, he was called to go and take charge of the situation. But it's obvious, it was obvious to him that somebody else was in control. He and his men who were guarding Jesus on the cross, they were doing this, but all these things related to Jesus seemed to be going on all around. And these, as these callous soldiers witnessed the events, they were overcome with great fear. They all acknowledged something was different about this man on the cross. Now there's disagreement as to what exactly is meant when it says here that surely this was the Son of God. The language actually allows for it either to be translated the Son of God or a Son of God. If it's a Son of God, it would be a Roman reference to the uniqueness of Christ without fully understanding what's meant in that. Luke seems to support this when he translates that what was said there was certainly this was a righteous man. There are many people in the world today that recognize the uniqueness of Christ, but they look to natural explanations. Yeah, Jesus was different. He was a unique individual. But part of our role as witnesses is to lead people from that general observation about Jesus into a full realization of who he is. He's not just the one around all these things are happening, but he's the one who's in control. Do you worry about what's going on in the U.S. and around the world? Are you trusting, in, trusting that God is in control and working out his purposes? In verses 55 and 56, we read that in many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Some of these women had followed Jesus from Galilee, and they were wealth, some of them were wealthy and supported Jesus in the, minist in the whole ministry there, as we read in Matthew 20, 20, and Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. They ministered to Jesus with a fearless devotion and continued to do so at this time. Here, all of the disciples, all of Jesus' disciples in fear had taken off going somewhere else, hiding out somewhere, and here these women were standing there at the cross. And in fact, as we'll see, either next week or the week after, that they're the first ones to the tomb. As they go there, going there to anoint the body, fearlessly, even as they think that the Lord is dead, even at that time, still having heartfelt 
devotion, willing to give their lives. You see, ministering to the Lord demonstrates relationship. And as we minister to the Lord, we see him accomplish his purposes in and through our lives. In fact, Acts chapter 13, the first three verses reads, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Lord said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So even in the early church there, as they sat there, they worshiped the Lord, they sought the Lord, they ministered to the Lord in worship. And then the Lord said, okay, go, I want you to do this. Jesus calls us through the things that we experience to worship him to have fellowship with him, to experience his presence, to see his working. I mean, how else can we live in this place? How else can we live on this planet if it's not in a relationship with him? If not, we're overwhelmed by our circumstances. But now, as we've read, we have access into the throne of grace. The scripture tells us that though Jesus was rich, he became poor that we might receive the riches of a real relationship with God. But the question for each one of us is are we taking full advantage of this privilege? Do you meet with the Lord on a regular basis to receive fellowship, encouragement, and instruction. It's your birthright as a believer. Don't settle for anything less than everything that Christ has purchased with his blood. Everything. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our pieces was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. As Peter quotes that in his epistle, he's using it to speak spiritually and saying that through the blood of Christ, we have full access into our relationship with God. Let's take advantage of it. As Paul declares to the Philippians that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed into the image of his death that somehow I might attain to the resurrection of the dead and what he was speaking about there was having that full knowledge that full close relationship with him not being satisfied with where he was at but pressing on in the knowledge of God pressing on in his relationship with the Lord. I mean, there's no other way to have real peace. There's no other way to have real purpose in our lives. There's no other way to have real experience, true fulfillment than in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone here who hasn't experienced that, I would be remiss if I didn't offer you that opportunity. So, as we're closing here now, we're going to pray. And I just invite anyone who hasn't come into a relationship with Jesus that you can. And the way that you do that, as the scripture tells us, is that as you come to him, you confess, first of all, that you're a sinner. Because the scripture tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we come to him confessing our sin, that we are sinners. And then the scripture tells us that we're to repent of our sin and, or to turn from that sin. Make a 180 degree turn. It's agreeing with God about the condition of your life. And then receiving Jesus Christ, as we've seen today, is that full payment for your sin upon the cross that will give you that access to the Father. So as we close this morning, Tammy's going to play one more worship song. I'll be up here, and a couple other people will be up here if there's anyone in need of prayer, either for that purpose or there's other need in your life that you'd like to go boldly to the throne of grace with, about with us. We'd love to do that with you. That we count as a privilege. So let's stand as we worship the Lord. All right, well. All right. Well, we could do this a cappella, right? Go for it. All right. When I 